Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation of the Kirk webinar series entitled Implementing Campus-Wide BIM Standards. My name is Larry Cook, and I'm the Recycling Coordinator at the University of South Carolina, as well as Chair of the Kirk Board of Directors. I'll be your moderator today. For those of you not familiar with Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition is a member-based organization that works to grow collegiate recycling and waste reduction efforts by fostering technical information exchange and networking opportunities between the staff and student leaders implementing programs. Today's program is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad, broad range of operational, educational, and other topics related to collegiate recycling and sustainable materials management. This is the fourth of six webinar programs generally held every other month on the first Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have more information about upcoming programs at the end of the webinar. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, Clean River, for making today's webinar possible. I also want to acknowledge Keep America Beautiful and ACI the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education for the planning and promotional support for the overall 2016 series. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over. If you have problems with your audio or video during the webinar, you can reach a live technician by calling GoToWebinar's customer support line at 800-263-6317. To avoid background noise, we've placed all but our panelists' lines on mute. We encourage you to submit questions at any time, however, by using the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Simply click the plus symbol where it says questions to type us a note, and we will read these out loud when we get to the end of the presentations. One final note, we will be placing the slides and recording of the webinar on the Kirk site within the next day so that you can review the session or share it with colleagues. We'll get started with the panel introduction. Today's program is focused on the process of creating and implementing a standardized system for recycling and waste bin. Most college and university recycling programs develop in stages over time. In the early years, the priority is often simply to get recycling bins in place, with less concern given to consistency between one location and the next. As grants or other sources of funding allow, bins may be set out for certain high volume materials or targeted for specific areas of campus like residence halls. Additionally, programs may shift from segregated material collections to single stream. The list of acceptable materials will evolve, or new buildings will come outfitted with specifically chosen bins to match the architecture. The result over time can be a confusing patchwork of mismatched collection bins. The color used for recycling bins in one location may be the same as used for trash in another, or the labels on some uh, they list acceptable materials that another classifies as a contaminant. This type of ad hoc collection infrastructure can effectively place one arm behind the back for recovery efforts as confusion over what and how to recycle causes people to tune out. As campuses set aggressive waste recovery goals or simply look to increase recycling, many are finding a significant opportunity by revamping their collect recycling and waste bin infrastructure around a common standard that includes consistent color coding, labels, and other features, as well as mapping bin placement to optimize user convenience. Beyond determining what those design attributes should be, there is the separate matter of actually getting them implemented across campus. How does one effectively involve stakeholders to create and get buy-in for the standards? With a decentralized institution, what are the policies and protocols needed to make sure bins purchased by different departments or building architects match the standard? Today's webinar will feature presentations from two schools at different stages of implementation. We'll begin with uh, Rochelle Owens from Dalhousie University, which has been progressively implementing a standard system for recycling organics and trash since 2010. Next, we'll hear from Aaron Muscati about the early stages to pilot and implement new bin standards at the University of Buffalo. Aaron will be joined by Tom Limbo from Clean River to share about their collaboration as the school has piloted a new bin setup. Following the presentations, Rochelle and Aaron will be joined by Alec Cooley from Keep America Beautiful and 
Bruce Buckin from Clean Rivers for an extended panel discussion. We will also invite attendees to share their experiences. Let's jump right in with our first speaker. Rochelle Owen has worked in the environment and sustainability field for over 25 years at nonprofit, government, and academic institutions. She currently works as the Director of the Office of Sustainability at Dalhousie University. Rochelle uses facilitation, community development, program management, and analytical skills to design programs and involve people in sustainability issues. Rochelle holds a Bachelor's of Science in Community Health, a Master's in Environmental Studies, and is a Lead Green Associate. She writes sustainability columns for newspapers and magazines. Go ahead, Rochelle. Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to launch right into this presentation. Okay, just to give you a little background on Dalhousie University, we're about 5.5 million gross square feet of building space, 25,000 uh, students and employees, and we have four campuses. Three are in downtown Halifax, and we have a fourth campus 100 kilometers away in more of a rural area. And um, we work on lots of different projects, including uh, energy, so that's why we have the two district energy systems there. Um, back in 2015, we created a solid waste management plan. The plan probably took us two to three years uh, uh, to create, and the plan process had um, uh, we worked with consultants, but in the end, we actually used the consultants' information and our own um, committee to to create our own plan, and some of that's reflected in there. Having a little problem here with my so key actions for for the next five years in our plan, which is also online. Um, there's five key areas: policy and planning, education, procurement, measurement, monitoring, and processing. And uh, we are working on different aspects of the plan, including uh, a fairly unique system where we're instead of using dumpsters, we've actually gone to internal collection, we use clear bags, uh, we're processing uh, material at the warehouse for one stop collection uh, because it saves money on hauling charges and we we're able to do more co compliance promotion, reduce illegal dumping, and uh, there's a number of other benefits. So um, if, I won't go through all aspects of the plan, but uh, there's different sort of big ideas that we're working on right now. So. Uh, uh, conceptually, there's uh, you know the four R's, uh, which you know rethink, uh, reduce, uh, reuse, recycle, and recover, and um, that's the common sort of framework, uh, in and really focus on conservation first, maximizing high value use, and ultimately trying to get to zero waste. Um, other terminology you might hear are, are, are terms like the circular economy, and that has kind of an, a, a business approach of trying to make sure that there's no actual waste and that you use um, inputs into a recovery process. So looking at those two frameworks, really sharing and recovery sort of fit into the method of conservation of reuse, uh, focusing on disposal items as products. And so just as an observation, there's very similar uh, concepts in the energy world, looking at efficiency first and reduction, and then looking at um, you know renewable energy or fuel switching. So in our strategy, we we really start trying to reduce the amount of commodities as the first uh, principle, which is kind of a waste efficiency thought. Then improve recycling and compost rates, and how you do that, of course, is to have those programs available, but there's a lot of different strategies you can use and, and, and look at your commodities and try to change things that are landfill bound in product nature and change them to um, compostable. If you look at food services as an example, taking a plate, uh, plastic uh, cutlery and changing it to maybe birch as an example. Or even better, one step up is to try to have metal cutlery. We're also trying to get uh, much more accurate weights for all the different streams that we track, and we've done a number of different programs to, to work on that. And education is, of course, a huge uh, 
key with everybody I know on the call probably struggles with that with the turnover uh, every year. So uh, how, we, how do we approach, because it's such a big topic and probably I'm guessing like us that it's a small group within a big institution to try to you know, facilitate change. So we try to look at it strategically and pick off commodities. So uh, we worked on paper as an example. So we have 100% post-consumer paper. We instituted a paper policy with uh, key reduction elements to it around uh, going to electronic processes, changing meeting etiquette so that it should be paperless, nobody should be printing agendas, that kind of thing. So that's a reduction end. And then, of course, having a recycling. That's probably an easier one that people have really done well over the years. And, and so what we do is go after each commodity, again, thinking of reduction first. So as an example, on furniture at the university, we have a surplus goods policy and almost like a, a DAL reused website where products internally are reused through a, a, a surplus goods policy and program. And so that enables us to reuse material before uh, we go down to the next stream of recycling. So uh, sort of mentioned trying to focus on key ones and we also look at the um, the weight and the volume of a different product so again you can't necessarily do everything but looking at the big ones that you can make change at first and get some um, wins under your belt as you work on the more challenging ones a good example too is sometimes there's uh, strategies that may be really challenging to do because uh, coffee cups uh, in in a residence hall is easier to manage if you can switch it over because it's one decision maker. Individual purchasing is much more challenging uh, because of the m number of people involved. Making your coffee cup, having the you know 20 cent discount on the refundable still may not work. So then trying to change your coffee cup to a compostable one. Then of course your composting system or group needs to be able to take that particular product. So. That's always the challenge sometimes too. And there's the uh, example of surplus goods. Chemical reuse is another example. And um, I have some other examples here around waste efficiency. We've done some unique things around uh, construction demolition waste where we've deconstructed a house as an example. It's construction in reverse to see what the highest percentage of um, waste diversion we can get through creating new jobs and then reducing the cost of the disposal. So trying to figure that out. Uh, improving recycling compost rates, reducing contamination, and this is really what we're here to talk about. The lead up to this is um, one key strategy is to have waste bin standardization and implementation across all your campuses. and probably similar in other institutions. We have this bolt-on approach where over the years, you know, recycling paper, recycling came in, compost might have came in, but nobody took away the extra garbage bins. So you have all these extra garbage bins, uh, excess volume, excess bags, and um, also knowing human behavior convenience and messaging and the messaging is go to the nearest bin and if, if it's contaminated people will just sort of pile on top of that. So rebooting the system is uh, a really important strategy and uh, we went to clear bags and did some other things as well. Here's a few picture. Uh, the top left is our uh, uh, dump and run which is basically I think a a lot of universities may have it where at the end of the year material from residents in the community in our case are brought to the gym and it's sold off for chair and the money goes to charity so it's quite a large event uh, with about a thousand community attending every year. Um, the top right is us doing a new office bin standard which is I'll talk about. The C&D deconstruction is on the top there and then an electronics recycling event. 
So the process for developing uh, the BIN standard here has been a bit of a journey and that, that's, I guess we have a, a, an opportunity at the university to use students in some of this research and uh, so I just wanted to walk people through uh, all the different steps we took. So initially I had students do BIN ratio audits and waste audits, basically determining how many garbage bins are there be, uh, compared to uh, uh, hello oh, okay uh, bins between uh, recycling and organics and doing waste audits uh, then we develop developed the standard and we did that through a variety there's that's probably what you see now is probably version 10 we had focus groups uh, we did testing, we revised the standard, and initially we were just thinking of a couple spaces, but I thought, oh, let's let's really do it and be comprehensive and look at all our spaces on campus, so that's why it took a little longer to create the lab standard, took quite a bit of time because we, we worked with different researchers to, and health and safety office to determine what solid waste and, and can be um, recycled in a lab and what's hazardous and what's biomedical and you know what's safe for a custodial so you'll see we have some extra material and postering on on the solid waste diversion in the lab setting then we created a bin tender and issued that and and uh, we have a winning vendor that we're doing all the bin upgrades with we created a very detailed store sheet for facilities so the way our role in this is that uh, we create standard work with everybody to implement this and then operations and facility facilities maintain it so it's been a journey you know we're you know doing teaching and learning with each our training with each other creating the tools that facilities need to make this uh, embedded in their systems which is I think is key uh, Office of Sustainability, we're not operations, we're here to sort of work as advisors and get people up to a certain speed and try to embed these things so that they continue on if without us. So, so there is a lot of upfront work in trying to make that really a uh, systems change. Uh, so we, we have that. Then we did a number of, we have Excel spreadsheets and I had students auditors go to pretty much every space on campus with custodial and they did an audit sheet of what was there compared to our standard and that's how we got uh, information on the cost of ordering just the scale and so those were pretty detailed and and they and took a while uh, we did pre-bin waste audits in a sample of buildings because the business case internally how I got the money was to show that we would achieve waste diversion um, um, metrics and also cost metrics from uh, waste tonnage diverted. Uh, so we have to do pre and post audits. We've done supervisor and staff training and uh, in order to implement this we need all the custodial aware of the program and on board and uh, understanding what goes where. We do sessions with building administrators to, to brief them on the standard implementation, how it's going to happen and why it's important. Communicate the standard and then do the bin implementation. We repurpose old garbage bins and repurpose them into to the, the proper standard and put, put them, repurpose them in the labs so the labs don't have to pay for, for that. Post audit and maintenance. So, we have done uh, two campuses out of the four, our largest campuses we're doing in November and I'll talk a bit about how we're going to pull that off. Uh, so just a little bit of the pilot buildings. We have done auditing since our office started and I was the first director in 2008. Um, and on average the garbage stream is 45 to 80 percent contaminated in the, the audits which is pretty high recyclables is is 2 to 30 but normally 20 or maybe a bit lower paper is 10% a bit lower or it's an organic so basically our worst problem is our garbage stream here's us doing a waste audit this fall with 70 engineering students so they had a class there's a class called 
waste management, I went in and did a lecture for that class, and um, and then we had them participate in an audit, one of our audits of the residence building, and so that's Jennifer um, in the plaid that works for my office, who's a student, and we organized that event and put it on, and it's. Uh, it's you know it's a stinky smelly event and I can pretty sure they go in maybe not knowing what goes where they come out and they 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 know what goes where so uh, it's uh, quite an event. So I previously I mentioned we did this bin ratio audit as one of the first steps and back in 2010 here's an example of the Halifax campuses of that bin ratio so you can obviously see we have way more garbage bins uh, compared to other streams and um, and really that's that's a huge problem because you're creating more opportunities for contamination and you're over servicing a fleet of bins that are or haven't been reestablished so that goes back to how does it get that way it's this bolt-on approach uh, over the years here's another example of uh, one of the pre-audits, and uh, this is in one of the floors of the library, and all the red bins, just look at all the waste bins in the, in the stacks of the library, so that's been changed. All those waste bins have been taken out, and um, we've added more four bin stations to the main atrium area. So obviously there's a, a, a servicing benefit as well, and a bag benefit by taking away all these bins and bags. So here's an example of pre-status uh, and where we, two of our big campuses still have this and in November we're going to, this will all be taken care of, but single garbage bins by themselves, uh, sort of people putting homemade signs that are actually not correct. Uh, you know, bottles only, that's because there's a five cent deposit on it, but um, under the law it's refundable, but a refundable is a recyclable, and you can't just have a refundable stream and not a recyclable stream. So anyway, we've dealt with all of that, and this program will clean that all up. Um, you know, they're the top middle picture is kind of a, it's indoor, but you, that's our outdoor bin again the language on the signs is incorrect and it doesn't have the fourth stream, so that will be all cleaned up. Um, so the new bin standard covers 12 space types and its objectives are to reduce contamination. Uh, our overall total diversion rate uh, from total all streams from the landfill is about 60% diversion, so um, we want to increase that to 70%. That does include operational construction, demolition waste. It does not include new construction. So big construction projects are in a separate area. This is kind of, you know, your electronics, your solid waste, your garbage, your recyclables, your organics, paper, cardboard, and um, C and D operationally. Um, other objectives of the standard provide clarity on what goes where, drive material to the four bin sets, save garbage bags, meet municipal and provincial legislative policy and waste management plan requirements. So in the past we received bylaw enforcement tickets um, and in my role, I, again we're not uh, the operational group but because we have a leadership role in these issues, I usually get copied on the enforcement tickets from uh, the governments and they see us as being a lever to help rectify some of these issues. The uh, last one is be in line with our reputation. We do have a reputation. Uh, we have plans. We have programs. We want to improve these areas. So when a stakeholder like Environment Canada, which would be like the US EPA, if you're in the States, says uh, there isn't proper spin standards for, for an event they're having, that's another example where we don't want to we want to show that we're doing, that we're walking the talk. Interestingly, uh, when I presented the business case to get funding for this project, I think some of the things that resonated with senior and men, so I report to the VP of Finance and men, um, and so when I presented this particular project, things that resonate were not our reputation, obviously 
um, provincial and municipal legislation not meeting that, and uh, waste contamination. So those were kind of the key ones. So the implementation, uh, we developed the, the standard with stakeholders. We, we compared to other universities. We had um, three summer research projects uh, over that period of time. We have a President's Advisory Council on Sustainability uh, that I presented, that I'm a part of and presented this project to. Uh, interestingly, we had some, my experience is uh, you'll, people will get kicked back, there's no question, but um, if it's well communicated and presented, then people will usually get on board and you know ride through the storm for a couple weeks. Um, but I did have to present this to the President's office and have a sit down with them. So we have uh, spent a little more time briefing pretty senior people and getting a building administration off, off on board. So, uh, oh, okay. So, um, and then I mentioned the business case approval and the repurposed uh, existing bid. So this implementation is uh, creating and communicating a standard. It includes new signage, uh, new bins, and clarifying whose role it is to do what. So I'm just going to quickly, because I know I'm going to run out of time here soon, just walk you through quickly um, the standard. So offices, we're taking out a, a single garbage bin, and we're putting in this item that you see below. It's a recycling bin with a side saddle, little garbage bin. The difference, custodial won't it doesn't service this now. It's the responsibility of the office pers a person in the office to bring it to the prog set, in, which is not very far away in the hallway. And the instruction is that for your food waste, you bring it to the hallway bin because we don't want you collecting it and leaving it in your in your office for rodent um, issues or, or bugs. So, um, and so that's the standard for office. Lunch rooms are catered spaces. If it's big catered spaces with a lot of uh, catering going on, they'll get a four bin uh, system depending on the um, size of the room and the catering. If if it's a smaller classroom and with no not a lot of catering, all bins will be taken out and the sign will go pack it in, pack it out. But you have to strategically place your hallway bins so those can be receptacles. The residence room, small waste bin and recycling, and a paper bag can, is provided to support organic sorting. Hallway stations are the prog set with the, this is an actually, this is an old, this is a retrofit. So we're doing retrofit of the existing bins and then we're putting in new systems. So this is an example of a retrofit where our new system actually would have appropriate colors on top, the appropriate slots, uh, stickers on top of the, the top, stickers on the bottom, and the signage on top. So we're doing a mix of retrofitting bins and putting in new bins. There's the example of a, a sort of a new bin system where you have, you know, your, your colors are following your visual signage, appropriate holes, and the bin signage on the bottom, or the sticker on the bottom. Meeting rooms again, pack it in, pack it out. Residents recycling room, because they want to use the refundables for um, raising money, then we have five streams because you still need the recyclable stream for items like milk containers that don't have a refundable, plastics, that kind of thing. Uh, commercial kitchens, there's the front and the back of the house. So we have worked with food services. No standalone garbage bins, organic bins at every workstation, central recycling carts, and paper recycling. And we do education there. Dining halls in the front, it's all, uh, there's no disposables, it's cutlery, except for peanut butter, which I guess is a allergy issue. Um, and we've changed the sizing of the bins. The organic bin is bigger than the garbage bin, but there's really not much waste in the dining halls. Washrooms, this is the joy of being in two different jurisdictions, one campus versus the other. So in one jurisdiction, you can compost paper towel in the bathrooms. In another one, there is, you can't, so we have to communicate that. Laboratories, uh, we, we're doing a whole separate outreach to them. 
we're providing the repurposed bins. They have we have created lab specific stickers that relate to the material there. Um, we've come up with this concept of a transfer bin and we have a whole protocol that we created with the Health and Safety Office. So maintaining the standard, that's up to facilities, so we have to work. Um, there's always some issues there, but trying to work with them collaboratively so that they know that they're the keepers and custodians of this pr program from that perspective. We've also created additional signage for construction and demolition waste and uh, that's being implemented now and by doing some analysis there we're saving money because we got the metals out of the mix C and D and that gives us cost benefit um, and we are um, getting the clean wood out of there so there's been some improvements there. We also, also created multilingual signage in uh, five different languages that will be put in key areas. We have an uh, what goes where guide, and uh, and basically that uh, tells what materials are are should go where. So these are some FAQs that we provide to people uh, that you could look over after that we are prepared ahead of time. Uh, we've finished implementation two smaller campuses, and we're calling our implementation on the bigger campus, the big switch. And it's going to be a huge logistical event with six teams, about 40 people from facilities, our office. We're going to hire more students, so we're going to pull that off uh, during reading week. And um, I'm just going to wrap up here. The uh, Basically, once we're finished, it should be a one-to-one -one ratio. And uh, we are seeing less contamination, positive feedback and uh, definitely more education is being requested because uh, we, can, we can see the issues with the clear bags. Some of the metrics, testimonials from employees and students, bag number reduction, uh, costs from tonnage reduction, and costs from bags, um, promotion of this as an initiative, and reduced compliance notices. So, we have an overall plan. I think I talked about that. You can see some of the things we're working on. And so key takeaways is that um, the, the business case was the key to get the funding to do this, what I say, one-time recorrection, right? So it's, as senior management knows, it's not an ongoing operational cost. It's a one-time restart to make us in compliance with you know, laws and policy, our own policies and programs and being compliance and and get better uh, costs around some of these things and better diversion from the landfill. So having the numbers through audits and ratio analysis help with all that. I even clicked in the emails from people saying that this wasn't good, that we didn't have these standards in place. Um, building on the work of others, so my just thought, feel free to t adapt and take anything that we have created. And uh, and it, I think the communications approach we took and involving people was uh, was very important. And you could start with a pilot as well. So I think that's it. I think I have fulfilled my time, so I better uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rochelle. That was great. We um, do have time for a couple of questions for you before moving on to the next presentation, I want to remind everyone that you can send in questions for any of our presenters by clicking on the plus sign next to the word question on the GoToWebinar dashboard. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, Rochelle, but um, you, you've done an impressive and an extensive amount of, of background work to make your business case over several years um, and looks like several research projects, uh, with all the work you've done and um, that being available for people to try and implement this on their campus, what do you think like a realistic time frame for um, implementing a similar project on another campus might be? I think, of course, it depends on the size of your campus. That's the first thing um, for a medium-sized campus larger so that takes more time just the sheer square footage. Um, 
if you already have waste audits done or a ratio analysis, then you can just package that together in a business case. Um, you you know you can repurpose bins and buy a few sets. So it's really about your uh, ability to get that that funding. But if if you kind of adapt it depending on how far you're along, but you could adapt some of the things that we have or others have. You know, realistically, you, you could probably pull something off, uh, you know, in a year or two, uh, depending, again, on the size and scale. I think we kind of, I started on this journey, and I thought, oh, let's just be comprehensive. That's why it took a little longer, so. Great. Um, and then uh, just a question on the savings you realize from or expect to realize from using fewer bags in fewer locations. Uh, did you already have composting collection and has there been a little bit of offset with the generally higher cost of compostable bags and adding in more stations or do you think you overall you're still uh, seeing a cost avoidance on bags? Right, okay. So we so we've we've had organics collection for a while. Nova Scotia is the first um, province in Canada to ban organics from the landfill back in ninety ninety six. Um, so we we do have ha organics everywhere in in all systems, and I think you know we are we are taking away bins and bags, but we are adding some. Uh, but there's a lot less uh, that we're adding back because if you think of all those office bins that were single garbage bins that had bags in them, and now the new system basically has no bag in it, and those and same with residence rooms, they're responsible for sorting. Um, that's a huge amount of volume of bags just in that. So we are going to add some more uh, prog sets, but the ratio I'm going to guess is probably we're going to take away 2,000 bins and reinsert maybe 500 and repurpose a number of bins in labs where they didn't have very good source separation. Great. Um, and then one final question on cost. Uh, do you, what's the average cost of the whole um, replacement system to buy new, not obviously the repurposing one, but so each station? Yeah. So it depends on, of course, your, your vendor, but, um, you know, uh, um, a 23 gallon bottom bin and then a top, depending if you have that, can be around uh, you know $60, but it'll depend. Could be 68 to 80 just for one bin set. So they're like a whole four bin prog system, you know, could be in in the order of um, you know 250 to 300. That's kind of the the scale. And of course, it is the uh, office bin sets are probably around $10. Okay. Great. Well, we'll have some time for more questions at the end during the panel, but um, let's move on to a polling question for everybody. Um, so the question is, do you have an official bin color and label standard? And the uh, four choices, uh, yes, implemented across uh, the whole institution or most of it, yes, early stages of implementing uh, actively developing new standards or not at this time. And if you'll take a couple minutes or a couple seconds to, to enter your responses, um, we'll uh, wait for those to come in. So uh, while we're doing that, one last question uh, for you, Rochelle. Um, you mentioned student employees. Would you say that for audits and the um, uh, both the bin audits and then the waste audits, were those mostly volunteers or were those paid uh, staff? And how do you kind of recruit them? Okay. So uh, some of the audits were where uh, we had like a campus-wide audit where we needed 50 people and we wanted to have custodial involved. So that was a mix of students doing classwork, student employees in our office, and, and mostly facility staff. Most of this project has been implemented through myself and student sort of as the overall kind of thinker around how to piece all this together and student employees. 
those are the people that do the bulk of, of the bulk of all this auditing and space analysis and implementation. The implementation is students and custodial. Um, and so they're heavily involved, and that's really important because they're the people that are going to maintain the system. So I think you know it took us longer, but that's probably a good thing. And the reason why you student employees because you're paying them, and you choose a high, you know, a really good student with analytical skills. Because we've also had did his class project, and as people know, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. So if you want to make sure you have good rigorous data and quality control, then I would suggest uh, for, for the key important parts that it's student employees. Okay. Let's see if we've got the response. Okay. Uh, a third of us have implemented standard across most of the institution. Um, another 20% are early stages. So, uh, and really only a little less than a third do not have it at a time. That's, that's very interesting. Okay, so next up we have Aaron Muscati, who is the Sustainability Education Manager at the University of Buffalo. Aaron creates and implements educational programs to help the campus community engage in sustainability initiatives and transform UV's operations. Aaron coordinates UV's participation in Recyclemania and works to unify people and departments across campus in waste reduction efforts such as a comprehensive move-out program and a zero-waste initiative at UB Stadium. We'll also be joined later in the presentation by Tom Limbo of Clean River. Uh, so take it away, Aaron. Hi. Um, is my sound all right? Okay. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And Rochelle, thank you so much for all the information that you shared. Um, you guys have... Uh, are really kind of the model that we've been looking at as we've been researching um, how we would begin to um, undertake this. So um, uh, as Bruce mentioned, I'm going to have uh, Tom Lembo jump in uh, toward the end of this presentation just while we are. Um, is, is there feedback on the line here that others are feeding or getting? I'm, I have an echo. It sounds good on this side, Erin. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so UB is a big place. Um, I'm just going to try to see if I can get my mouse. There we go. Okay. Um, UB is a really big place. We have three different campuses. Um, one primarily um, our undergraduate campus, the other professional campus. Um, and then we have some downtown, um, a medical campus. Um, so that's um, close to uh, 11 million gross square feet, so it's a big place, a lot of ground to cover, and um, it would be very expensive um, to uh, undertake um, replacing all of the bins that we have. Um, we also have a lot of students on this campus, um, and uh, we know that they want uh, more opportunities to engage in um, waste reduction behaviors. So our program began in, um, like, probably many of your programs uh, in the mid-80s with just paper recycling and um, students were collecting paper from offices and then we were sorting it in a warehouse and then we were selling it by type. Um, it, we quickly, it was quickly discovered that um, if we were going to have a comprehensive program that just was the scale of that system just wasn't going to work. In the mid-90s, um, we uh, implemented co-mingled recycling. So we had uh, paper um, containers um, being collected separately. And um, what we also did at that point was we began to um, expand uh, recycling opportunities outside of offices and to public areas. So um, once we, in the uh, 80s, uh, one of our first steps was to give everyone a blue desk side bin and a small trash buddy so that people could recycle paper in their offices because we felt that's where it was being produced. In the 90s, we thought, uh, or we recognized after doing trash audits, uh, waste audits, that um, there was a lot of, um, there were still a lot of recyclables ending up in the trash just because people didn't have the opportunity to recycle them. So we slowly put um, 
commingled collection into public areas. And um, uh, one of the other things that we did in the early 2000s, in addition to um, beginning our compost uh, pre-consumer uh, collection, was we expand. Uh, we switched out to a single stream um, for collecting recycling and that was motivated by a couple things. Uh, one was the market in our area. All of our recycling haulers were going to um, a single stream uh, recycling collection method. So um, in order to get a competitive price for um, recycling services, um, we had to make an adjustment. But then we also saw that as an opportunity. Um, we, we already had blue recycling bins in all of our offices. Um, and at the time, people were just able to recycle paper. So by expanding um, to, or changing rather, to an all-in-one system, this gave people the opportunity to recycle um, common materials right at their desk as opposed to having to go and find a, a space in, in a public area to recycle items other than paper. Then in uh, 2014, we started to develop um, a strategy um, uh, around zero waste. And really what that was, was it was more of an internal way to start a conversation. Um, the Office of Sustainability had uh, recognized that we needed to do more, um, that we were not um, capturing as much, as much as we could, and that we could do a lot better. However, um, there didn't seem to be the appetite amongst um, the key players on, on campus um, to make a change uh, because it was uh, for many reasons. But by getting together with um, all of the key departments on campus that uh, are involved in producing large amounts of waste and saying, let's start, talk, let's start thinking about waste differently, that gave us a door. So we had to create the, the, the door ourselves, but at least we now have a door and we're trying to open it. Um, one of the um, baby steps out of that uh, strategy that we developed was um, one of the items was we would like to pilot uh, zero waste events in different areas. And um, we decided to pilot um, zero waste at the football stadium. We have six home games. Um, and uh, it, was, it seemed um, more manageable in that we knew um, the concessions was managed on campus. We could work with, those, with that staff to, um, to identify uh, what was going to be produced coming out of the stadium. We were able to um, identify in, um, alternatives if materials weren't uh, yet already recyclable or compostable. And um, because people are going into a stadium, we had an automatic choke point in, in terms of we were able to greatly uh, reduce the opportunities for contamination because people weren't allowed to bring in um, uh, consumables. So that's been going on for a few years. And um, we, um, and it's been a very vi highly visible um, campaign. Um, I would not, we are not yet achieving zero waste, but we are getting the conversation started and we're using it as a pilot and constantly tweaking and adjusting the way that we're doing things. Um, and we have that as our goal to be a zero waste stadium. So then, um, and out of that also came um, just awareness um, that, wow, there are a lot of different uh, recycling uh, bins on this campus, and that's confusing. So um, that's where we are in our process. We have not, we do not yet have um, a comprehensive strategy for um, standardization, um, but we have, we've been able to begin uh, the, the conversation um, around that. So the way that our, pro, our recycling and composting program works, um, is kind of complicated. We have, um, it's, and I would, I, I like to say that our recycling program is kind of sort of managed. So what does that mean? Um, we have our university facilities um, that has our, our custodial staff for our academic and staff buildings. We also have um, campus living where the students 
live, and um, they have their own custodial department. Then we have Campus Dining and Shops. They manage their own um, composting program. Uh, right now it's pre-consumer. And um, they also manage the recycling that's coming out of the kitchen. So we don't have one recycling program um, manager on this campus. Um, and that is a problem. Um, units respond to recycling, uh, create, uh, implementing recycling programs based on um, the pressure that uh, the Office of Sustainability applies to them um, to participate. Um, but that results in uh, the programs being um, pretty parochial um, and inconsistent. So the good thing about what we have on campus right now is there are lots of opportunities to recycle. If you're looking to recycle, you'll probably be able to find a bin if you can figure out what it looks like. Um, we do have a lot of enthusiastic participants. As you can see, these are the students um, that help us uh, operate our zero waste program at the stadium. Um, they really like to do this. They like to participate in waste audits. They want to see um, the program improved. Um, and we have a fairly steady diversion rates. We're converting about 34% of our material from landfill. That's not great, but it is consistent. Um, the other thing that we have going for us is we have a lot of mid-level managers that are supportive and want to do the right thing and want to improve um, the University of Buffalo uh, from a sustainability perspective. So um, when we're thinking about the good, the bad, the ugly, so the bad is we do not have an official budget for recycling. So that means that every time we want to um, purchase additional bins, um, appeals have to be made and budgets need to be looked at, usually within our grounds department. And um, sometimes we've used scrap metal, um, uh, uh, money is coming in to pay for bins. Other times we've used um, money that's generated from electronics recycling to pay for bins. But it's it's very um, it's very inconsistent and um, it's difficult to develop um, for us to kind of identify the path forward when we don't know how much uh, money we have available to us um, on on a consist on a regular basis. Um, the other thing that um, is difficult is that. The equipment is ad hoc in that um, you know we started with our blue bins in the offices. Um, we then expanded to um, Rubbermaid units in the hallways, but then there were some departments that said, "Well, that doesn't really match our decor, um, so we're, we'd like it to be white." The president's office, well, we'd like stainless steel. Well, we'd like this. So all of a sudden, um, it becomes very difficult for the average person on campus to be um, traveling through spaces which they feel are um, one space, a campus, and have have it be readily apparent as to how do I find a recycling bin. Um, and I'm sure that many of you also face that. So the other thing that um, has been has uh, been a difficult uh, difficult uh, for us is that. Um, we have a lot of inconsistency as far as signage and instruction go. While um, the Office of Sustainability has developed different signage um, to be placed in places, we don't necessarily um, uh, have the resources to deploy uh, signage in um, you know close to 11 um, million gross square feet across 11 million million gross square. Feet square feet. So we often rely on people, um, our custodial staff, students, and others to place signage. And sometimes um, it's placed correctly, and sometimes it's not. Um, and sometimes um, it, nothing is done with it at all when we hand it out. And I think that that uh, gets us to the last point on this uh, current state of affairs, um, that we, we really um, 
uh, we don't have the uh, high-level administrative uh, champion. We have our, obviously, the Office of Sustainability and our Chief Sustainability Officer, um, but there's uh, no one person um, that we've been able to identify um, yet, and maybe maybe that's just because we haven't asked the right the right people. Um, uh, you know, would they? Add, would, can they be an advocate for um, the uh, the improvements that we need? So, uh, as the old adage goes, uh, when life gives you lemon, lemons, um, you know, you, you either make lemonade or you, or or you do something else with them. So, what we wanted to do was, given all of that history, figure out you know what it is that we actually can accomplish. Um, so, f in order to do that, we first needed to decide what we wanted. So we really would like um, there to be an equipment standard. We'd really also like people to have access to a toolbox of resources um, and um, a purchasing guide um, that different entities could reference in order to make sure that consistency is achieved. Um, and then also common servicing standards. Um, you know, a perfect example, we have a, 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 two, a tandem um, a barrel system that um, we would like our custodial staff to use in pub, in uh, while they're going about their rounds picking up recycling and trash. Um, and that's because we want people to know that when they are putting something in a recycling bin that it then gets collected as recycling. Um, but for reason, um, and there are many, sometimes the custodians will have a single um, barrel and they'll have a bag within a bag system or a bag next to a bag, but the perception um, from the, from the uh, community member on campus is that it's all going in one bag um, and then, um, you know, one of the uh, chains in our link is broken and, and back we go again. So to really come up with a standard system for this is how um, unit, uh, equipment needs to be serviced I think would go a long way. And then also um, finally, and um, this is the big piece, you know, a strategy for how we're going to be adding new equipment um, on the campus. So we do have that strategy. We have our um, our Toward Zero Waste um, document that was developed uh, in collaboration with all of the uh, with many different departments. Um, so there are I pulled out a few of the goals that relate to creating bin standards. So. Uh, analyzing what it is um, that is in our waste stream is obviously a first step and a big one um, for us. And fortunately, um, the students on our campuses really like to um, get dirty, so they, they uh, enjoy doing this type of thing. Another is um, developing a management tool so that we can um, better know uh, where the equipment uh, lives and if it gets moved uh, where it needs to go back to um, and then also help us um, uh, uh, better manage what it is we have in different places. Um, so developing um, the inventory and creating a consistent brand to ensure that people can easily identify um, what is a recycling bin and how to recycle, or what is a composting? What does a compost bin look like, and and what needs to go in the compost bin um, are key. In addition to um, the uh, how to manage the equipment that we would actually have. So, given that we know that we need bin specs, but politically speaking, here on this campus, we haven't been getting anywhere. Um, we have new leadership, and there. Um, Obviously, with uh, any change in leadership, some t there's a lot of there's um, some catching up that needs to uh, happen, and they're preoccupied with getting the lay of the land. Um, and um, until there is a demand from from senior leadership to take action, um, uh, other administrative directors maybe are not going to make that move because uh, they don't feel um, comfortable doing it yet. Uh, we'll enter the UB brand. So here at the University at Buffalo, a lot of time and importance was given to um, how uh, the University at Buffalo is represented. 
So our thought here uh, at the sustainability office was, okay, we spent about two years developing this plan um, about how UB needs to be represented. And part of that is um, advocating that we are a sustainable campus. So that's good. That's been identified as being important and being and that's been identified as something that, that we want to port that we want to portray. So our thought was how do we use this um, to focus attention on our recycling needs? So um, once the new brand um, and the uh, uh, policy was released, we contacted our um, uh, the friendlies in our university communications office, and you know, of course, um, we thought it was great. And um, how do we help? And would it make sense for us to uh, brand our uh, recycling bins with a new look, with the new uh, University at Buffalo logo and the colors? And you know, what else could we do um, to make sure that we're being consistent with how the University at Buffalo is being represented? Um, they liked that idea a lot, and um, it was decided, all right, let's develop a pilot um, that we can showcase um, to build consensus around. So in thinking about where it is that we're going to start, um, we thought about, well, what's a place that pretty much everybody um, visits at you know, one point during the semester, if not daily? Um, so the student, union, the student union was one place, and fortunately for us, um, not only is it a very um, populated, busy place, um, but we have a lot of um, allies. What, you know, we call our um, our sustainability advocates. Many of them are um, staff members in the student unions. So we approached them and um, said, hey, listen, what would you think about um, us coming in and evaluating the equipment, the recycling equipment in the student union? It's a mixed use space in that we have public, um, we have public space in the student union, so we have one type of bins in the public space. We have classrooms in the student union, so there are different bins in those rooms. We have offices, again, different bins. We have um, eating areas, again, different bins. So this was kind of a really um, easy uh, building for us to say, hey, problem, we all know it. So why don't we go through the building and um, do an audit to identify, um, to evaluate the equipment that we have in place and then also use that, uh, the outcomes of that uh, to make sure that we're going to improve um, recycling opportunities in the student union, all the while going back to um, the student union's mission of providing exceptional student service and creating an exceptional experience for students. So um, what we did was we did an inventory of bins um, on throughout the student union to determine what uh, what is out there and what needs to be pulled and um, at that point we had um, I had been having conversations with uh, Tom at Clean River and uh, Tom and I went through the student union on a number of occasions um, to identify what we're currently using and what would alternatives be that would uh, pr provide consistent messaging and uh, provide um, opportunities where they needed or we needed to have opportunities provided for students and faculty and staff. Um, so we physically uh, we we labeled all of the bins and um, locations um, and. Uh, Tom provided us with some uh, sample with a sample unit, which we tested, and our custodians got to touch and feel it. And did they like the way that it, they were going to be servicing it? Um, what did they think about the the opening? What did they think about the signage? Um, and we really were able to customize the bin um, to to uh, provide the. Uh, experience that we wanted the students and others to have when they were looking to recycle on, on campus. Um, Tom, I don't know if, if now you'd like to quickly jump in and kind of, uh, from your perspective, um, what you thought about the process and, and those that were involved in the process. Sure. And, and thank you, Aaron. And, and I'll, I'll touch on a few things, but you did a very good job actually uh, 
going through the process. But when we were uh, collaborating with Erin uh, regarding uh, everything that she was facing, because she's doing, like I said, a tremendous job there, uh, we tried to emphasize a, a few things. One of them was flexibility. So one of the things we know is that what the recycling program looked like 10 years ago is different than what it looks like today, different than what it looks like 10 years from now. So uh, a bin that can grow with your program was essential. So uh, currently there's a two-stream uh, container that you see in the picture in front of you, uh, but it has the flexibility because down the road uh, compost or organics may come into play. Uh, perhaps, you know, in some of the states that, that uh, people who are listening, a bottle bill may come into effect and you might need to separate your bottles from your, from your regular recycling. So Andrew, you just don't know what the program's going to look like tomorrow. So to have the ability to to keep updating graphics, to change the configuration of the bin, and to keep it um, to keep it moving forward, I guess, um, is essential. One of the other things, uh, Aaron touched on a bunch of different locations that she had to deal with, and a bunch of different areas in which bins were located. Um, you know, a lot of you struggle with what do you do in the cafeteria versus a hallway uh, versus a classroom versus outside. And there might not be one bin for each different location, but our experience is if the messaging, meaning the graphics is consistent, if the opening shapes are consistent, if the color coordination is consistent, uh, then typically you, you've set a pathway for success because there's less confusion regardless of where the student is in, in the building. We always say people want to do the right thing, you just have to make it incredibly easy for them to do it. Uh, one of the other things when walking when walking through uh, with Aaron was a lot of the places where we were putting the new recycling containers, um, there were existing waste cans. One of the things we see over and over and over again, regardless of the facility, is an implementation of new containers, but a reluctance to remove the existing, uh, we coined the phrase, rogue containers uh, that are in the area. So sometimes you'll see a pretty new recycling system with a waste can. Uh, that only collects waste maybe 20 steps away. These become catch-alls for everything and typically really mess up your, your um, diversion rate. Um, so another thing that's always a nice to have is uh, materials that the bins are made out of. So if it can be made out of a responsible material, uh, material with recycled content, um, then we tend to find that uh, a lot of purchasing uh, departments are, are kind of going in that uh, direction. Is there um, some other things I should touch on, Erin? I, I think that um, that's really helpful and, and adds a lot, Tom. And one of the things, I know we have only a couple more minutes uh, prior to opening mm -hmm. it up to some questions, but um, if I, uh, trying to advance to the next slide, but having, there we go. Um, but what we, what we really wanted to do um, and what Tom and had helped us to do was really kind of use the student union as our pilot. So like Tom said, we wanted to make sure that we had we pulled out all of the um, the public area recycling and trash um, opportunities and then replaced them with our new um, and improved units. And we did that um, because we wanted to be able to point um, uh, students and others um, to the student union is this is where we're going as a university and this is what um, recycling is going to start looking like across the campus. So, so Aaron, um, do you, do you, yeah. do you emphasize uh, when, when trying to tackle something like this, do you emphasize uh, a pilot uh, of a small area, you know, to get the janitorial staff buy-in, to get the students buy-in? Did you find that to be a critical component as opposed to a complete uh, rollout of a building all at once? Uh, yeah, I always, I always uh, like to to use the word pilot in many of the things mm -hmm. that we're that we're doing. Um, do. It helps me to do things kind of fast and light, and sometimes um, that's the only way to actually get something accomplished. Um, and that doesn't, and but it it allow it allows me the flexibility to change things if if needed uh, without others viewing it as wow they're making changes that that was a failure um, no it's a pilot so we are trying new things and we're going to tweak and adjust and um, you know uh, make sure that it is it's a good fit in the long run um, and what we've been doing is we've pointed um, our facilities planning and design folks our medical school folks um, and 
and others to the student union. We're building a huge medical school downtown and they have already identified, okay, we need you to help um, as we're trying to figure out um, you know, the, the equipment that's going to be going into the building. You know, can you help us identify some recycling bins? Yes, go to the student union, look at these, what do you think, do you like it? Um, so it's it's giving people uh, the ability to kind of touch and feel things and make sure that there's the, the buy-in um, that that we need in order for uh, a rollout um, at this level to occur. Um, you know, as we move forward, um, we're really publicizing to to people and. Positions of power. This is an example of what bins across the campus um, could look like, and this is how you know we um, anticipate them functioning. Um, and then, based on feedback from our custodial staff, you know we have adjusted things here and there. Um, but as a, as a direct result of the pilot in the student union. Um, the uh, Office of Sustainability has been asked to convene a working group to develop campus recycling standards um, to ensure that you know branding, appearance, and function are always met. So I think that in that sense, the pilot um, has helped us achieve one of our long-term goals, which is to create these standards because um, without something to just the the way that we are in the landscape here at the University of Buffalo um, I wasn't getting the traction that I needed um, when I was saying hey you know who wants to who you know we, we'd like to really develop some recycling standards but um, hey we need the custodial staff to do this or could we have some students do that or could we um, get some uh, could we talk with purchasing about um, uh, developing um, different guidelines for buying? Everyone was kind of dismissing the ideas. But um, now that others have asked us to develop this, um, because we have um, rolled out this pilot, I think we're finally going to um, be able to accomplish um, something really big um, and strategic for our um, path forward. So. Um, that's that's about where we are, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Aaron and Tom. Uh, before we move on to the panel, let's do one question for Aaron. Um, after you listed your the list of the your lemons, uh, you said that you had four priority areas that you wanted to address. Can you just kind of run through those? I mean, just the heading of those four priorities again. Um, are you talking about um, within our strategy for zero waste? Yeah, well, you so. Oh, um, uh, yeah, we, we wanted like, um, equipment, sorry, <laughs> yeah, we wanted right. equipment standards. We wanted mm -hmm. a toolbox of resources. Um, so maybe that would uh, that that would definitely include um, instructional information, but then also kind of the the what goes where type documents, um, a right. purchasing guide, and then servicing standards, and then okay, also um, yeah, thank you. All right, uh, let's do move on to the panel. Um, and I'm going to introduce Alec Cooley from Keep America Beautiful to set things up. Uh, go ahead, Alex. Great. Thank you, Larry. And, um, and thank you, Rochelle and Aaron. So what we want to do is um, use this time that trying to have more of an interactive conversation around the, all, all the different aspects to, to both creating standards but also implementing them. And as part of this, um, I, uh, I, I want to have some questions that I'll pose to to uh, Rochelle and Aaron, and, and I also want to introduce Bruce Buck in, in a moment. Uh, but I also want to um, to open this up for other campuses who have implemented these types of standards. Tell us about what you've done. Um, please use the chat function um, that's in the GoToWebinar chat uh, box, and you can uh, type in notes uh, in, in addition to any additional questions you might have. Um, please share if you have experience on some of these points. What has worked? What hasn't? Uh, so, as again, I, I, as I said, I want to introduce to this um, discussion, bring in Bruce Buchan from Clean River Solutions. Uh, Bruce is the CEO and president of Clean River, and um, we've worked quite a bit in in the past. And I know he has a, a lot of expertise 
on, on these issues, so I wanted to encourage him to also participate in this discussion. So I'll go ahead and start off with, with uh, two, two questions that I, again, put out to the full group. Feel free to type in your responses um, if you're an attendee, and Larry will uh, give voice to those as we go along. Uh, one of those is going to be, tell us about some of the, the actual design attributes. What is it that you look for are the priorities when you're um, select, looking for the bin style that you're going to put in place, both from an aesthetics perspective, from an ergonomics, um, label and signage. What have you found works and what are the, sort of the critical things that, that you look to make sure are part of, of the, the bins um, that, that are placed out? and thinking that holistically, um, both indoor settings but also outdoor settings. And then the, the other question that I, I, I encourage folks to submit um, comments about is, is coming back to one of the points that Aaron was making about stakeholders, it can be very difficult to get everybody to buy into that. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear from folks what what has been successful? Where have you found uh, strategies that have been effective to work with different stakeholders and get them to buy in, whether that be uh, with auxiliaries such as housing or if it's involving custodial or if it's including uh, administrators? Um, there are a lot of those moving parts and, and would love to hear some, some of the things that um, can, be, can help to achieve that. So with that said, uh, Rochelle, if I can start with you, and, uh, and coming back to that first question about some of the specific um, design standards, what are some of the things that, that, that with the standards you have in place, are critical um, with how the bins are designed? And Rochelle, if you're there, we're, you're muted. Let, let's go ahead and, and, and continue. Um, Aaron, do you have anything that you would add in terms of, I, I know right now you're in, you're in the pilot stage looking um, with the bins showed earlier. Are there things of this um, that, that you think are, are critical to make sure that yeah. bins function and do their job? Yeah, I would say um, color is very important. Um, at least that's what my uh, my experience is telling me. Maybe as we go through the process, that um, I'll be convinced otherwise. Um, but uh, that's something that I'm I'm currently thinking about is color, and then also consistent um, uh, use of terms. You know, the wording um, that we use to communicate. Uh, this is Rochelle. Uh, I, I would say uh, color coding is important for showing that visual standardization that matches up with your signage. Again, uh, usually this sorting process is not top of mind, so you have to make it very convenient and it, subject to the con in conscious mind. So, so the color coding and the, and the type of bin slots and the signage helps with that kind of bringing it to the forefront. Uh, ergonomics, we do talk with facilities about looking at bins that are easy to manage and and are ergonomically easy for, for the, that group. We've had discussions about aesthetics and um, we picked the standard we did and we we retrofitting as well to save money. Uh, if somebody really wants a very high-end uh, bin system they, we suggest they can pay for it, but it still has to meet this standard. So usually that becomes a deterrent in, in, in most places. Gotcha. Great. Bruce, um, if I can um, bring you into the conversation. From your experience, are there, are there attributes that you found are effective um, again, for making sure that people are sorting correctly uh, to, to reduce contamination, and, and, and in particular, I, I guess, is there anything you would share about the labeling, the signage? Is there anything about how you communicate um, that, that, that you would suggest? Can you, uh, sound check, can you hear me okay? Yep, we, we, we can hear you great. Okay, well, well, stop. 
Alec, thank you for allowing me the privilege of sharing some of my experiences here. So just getting right into the design attributes that I've found to be very important. First off, you have to address the safety issue, and that's EDA height, fire rating, serviceability, uh, no sharp edges. And I say that because in many times, custodial have to deal with this, and sometimes it could be a hazard. And Erin spoke about it earlier where she got custodial buy-in on the design, which is critical because at the end of the day, they're your last line of defense. If it's not working for them, uh, the program falls down. And sort of to sum it all up over the years, what I have noticed is that when it comes down to aesthetics, I've spoken about this where at times architects can be the number one killer of programs, all about design, and they don't factor in because they haven't been educated on what they're trying to do. That come across okay? Yep, yep that, that, that was great. Larry, let me ask if, if, uh, if we've had any um, comments coming in from the audience to suggest, or if you have anything to add. Um, I, uh, there, there's nothing specifically on that question come, that's come in yet, but I would just echo the um, trying it out because people who don't have to service these every day may not realize how cumbersome it is to have to lift the whole aesthetic cover off every time or if the bag holders don't actually hold the bags in place. And so to really feel trialing something that may look beautiful on the outside is, is really important. Great, good. And, and then what, uh, you know, for, from my experience, I'll add a couple observations. When you look at things like the label, the signage, um, you know, having this simple, clear language is, is real um, important. Again, one of the things we're trying to do with with the bins is communicate what they are as as, as easily as possible to to reduce that confusion. Um, having lots of verbiage and and long explanations of what's supposed to go in, what cannot, can can be self defeating on a certain level. The other thing that that's been found in a lot of experiences, and there's and there's some research that that underlies this, is is using icons. Um, you know, so having a visual you, um, in addition to verbiage about what what goes in, in certain locations. Great. Let me um, let, let me throw out another question, which is going to again how how one sells it, how how you involve stakeholders to get that buy-in. The, the example has been given about housekeeping, um, and you, you certainly from um, the, the folks who actually are emptying it will know. Some of the the issues on, on ergonomics and others, but I know that there also could be the process of getting support from auxiliaries and other locations. Um, I'm, I'm curious if uh, Rochelle, from, from your experience, were there any lessons learned about involving people or how you got um, how you got folks to to accept and buy into the standards, including architects and others who who might be um, might be involving when you look at new buildings. Yes, uh, so for architects, for for any new buildings, we just um, all the uh, capital construction staff and uh, planners and project managers at in facilities. This is our standard. So then, when that when, you know part of the lead program or whatever, we just say that's what you have to order, and that's all in the stores. So we have that sort of embedded in the system. And then in terms of getting to the standard, I think we took we took a fair while over the, you know, because we took a while to sort of develop it, I think we did a top to bottom engagement process to, to develop the standard. So we had focus groups where we, you know, we had lunch and we met with uh, custodial supervisors, actual custodians. We did training. Uh, we listened to them. We provided feedback. So it's been a long partnership. Um, with that group right up to the uh, director, so all the way through the facilities group from uh, the custodial staff right up to the director of operations. We've been engaging in the process um, 
and then I think with uh, ancillary services, it's the same kind of thing. We try to form relationships where we identify the win-win for, for each other on, on the project. So, and certainly it helps when I can get things centrally funded. Uh, that's probably the biggest, uh, you know, opportunity. I said, okay, we're all in agreement. If I can get this one-time project funding, because I think Aaron, some of the Aaron said we don't have a waste education coordinator or a sort of a set uh, budget for this. So, you know, restarting the system and building that budget and getting that business case through, everybody's like, oh, that's that's good. Great. Um, from the aesthetic side, I know one thing that, that will be experienced sometimes at different institutions is a desire for, yes, we, we think the idea of, of standardizing and having a uniform system is is valuable. Make sure that it looks pretty. That has to be the number one consideration. And, and, and I think we also, we, we all know that, that there, there are functionality issues that come down to the aesthetics that have to be able to um, uh, that the bin has to be able to communicate what it is. Um, and, and I'll open this up for, for anybody. If, if there are, are suggestions on in terms of how you how you um, balance that act, you know, how, how is it that you have bins that uh, are both pleasing and they they, they uh, you know the president's office is happy and they're they're content having this be out outside of the office, but at the same time uh, avoid that, that pressure that it, it simply needs to look nice and therefore they, they look generic and you can't tell them apart from trash. Does anyone have experience or, or suggestions along those lines? Uh, look, um, I could weigh in on that one if you'd like. Okay. Please. All right. Bruce. As we've uh, worked with a lot of different organizations, we face this all the time. From, you know, you can have the executive levels where they require something, you know, that matches the decor down the classroom level, hall room level, warehouse facilities. And what I found is, as Tom mentioned earlier, there is not one thing that will do it. And it all depends on budget. But if you have the common factors of openings, and graphics, and interchangeability, at least as people move around the property, there is a consistency because I've seen it firsthand. What they need is maybe good walnut grass for the C-suite and it just goes from there. Plus also factor in, if it's gonna be in a warehouse setting where the forklifts are outside potential abuse, you want a bin that's gonna take the rigors of day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, you know, use at the start. Yep. Great, Thank, thanks for sharing that. It, Anyone else have um, anything you would want to add to that point? Okay. And if not, if not, what I would suggest is uh, because we are we are coming to the end of our time, Larry. Why don't we go ahead and and go over some of our closing slides and and um, some of the upcoming items we have come, uh, webinars and other programs coming up that we can share. Okay. Well, we do still have two more webinars coming up for our 2016 series. Our next program is coming up um, on October 20th on campus food recovery programs, a 360-degree focus on the unique challenges and opportunities in housing. Um, actually, that, that may be left over. We're do, looking at campus food recovery programs. Then uh, December 8th, getting into the details, um, which should be very interesting for looking at smart contract language to move campus operations toward waste reduction goals. And that's, uh, that's really about setting yourself up for success. So for more details, go to uh, our website, www.kirk3r.org, uh, and you can register there. Kirk is also excited to host its fall 2016 workshop to be held at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in conjunction with ACE's annual Higher Education Sustainability Conference. The all-day workshop will be part of ACE's pre-conference program on Sunday, October 9th. This all-day workshop will include keynote presentations, roundtable discussions, a tour of Johns Hopkins University's recycling program, and opportunities to network with fellow campus recycling and sustainability people from across the country. Note, the deadline to register through the ACE conference system is next Thursday, September 15th. If you're in 
before, join us for an informal networking get-together at the Pratt Street Ale House directly across the street from the Baltimore Convention Center. Also, we have some upcoming uh, partner webinars and conferences. Uh, the Introduction to the State Electronics Challenge webinar, September 13th. Um, Purchasing for Zero Waste webinar from the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council on September 15th. Um, planning a Recycling at Work event for America Recycles Day, September 23rd. And the Students for Zero Waste conference 